Hi, everybody. Welcome. I'm let, letting everyone um, join from Hello. the meeting room. Thank you for coming. I'm Misty Madero. I manage the UCR Riverside EPIC SBDC SBR STTR Resource Center. I'm glad you could join us today for our SBIR talk series. I'm going to ask everyone except our speakers to mute their video and um, microphone for the presentation. We will have questions um, at the end of the presentation and at that time um, you can put your question in the chat or raise your hand and we'll call on you and then you can and put your video and microphone on um, to ask questions. Today um, I have with me from UCR um, Mar my colleague Martin Kleckner. He is an entrepreneur in residence with our EPIC SBDC with over 30 years experience helping entrepreneurs succeed. We are with the Office of Technology Partnerships at UC Riverside. Our office facilitates the development and commercialization of ideas emanating from UCR and the community. The areas of focus for our office are technology commercialization, corporate and strategic partnerships, and innovation and entrepreneurship. Under our Innovation and Entrepreneurship Program, we have our EPIC Small Business Development Center, or SBDC, and our SBR STTR Resource Center. Our SBDC provides individualized support to early stage tech entrepreneurs and companies in Southern California to grow their businesses at no cost. And additionally, our Resource Center will help you submit a winning proposal. And here are some of the resources that we provide under our resource center. We can help you find partners. We help you communicate with the program managers. We connect you to university resources such as students and faculty experts. We can review and improve your proposal drafts, help you with your commercialization plan, help you build your team and connect to potential partners. If you're interested in learning more about the resource center, EPIC SBDC or the Office of Technology Partnerships, please email me for more information. This webinar is brought to you in day, today in part and thanks to the SBA and our lead center, Orange County Inland Empire Network. So with that, I'd like to introduce our guest speaker today, Shomit Ghosh. He is a general partner at Silicon Valley venture capital firm, Onset Ventures, which he joined in 2001. Prior to becoming an inventor, he was a startup entrepreneur with multiple successful exits. Shomit has also served as a lecturer at UC Berkeley's College of Engineering and at the University of San Francisco School of Management. He is an advisory board member at UC Riverside and is a computer science graduate of UC Berkeley. Thank you, Shomit. I will stop sharing my screen so you can um, share my screen. Screens. Yes, and then right. again, um, for those of you joining late, I'm gonna ask everyone but the speakers to mute their video and uh, microphone, and then at the end, when we have questions, you can um, pop back on. Okay, everyone can see that screen? Yes. Great, well, uh, thank you for the very kind introduction, and thank you to Misty and Martin and Rosabelle for inviting me to speak today. Uh, really excited to be here, uh, thrilled and honored. Uh, what I wanted to talk about today was uh, the COVID-19 crisis, and certainly that's, a, that's a been a very tragic uh, situation worldwide, is also serving as a catalyst to innovation. So um, there are aspects of the COVID-19 crisis that may help us meet the healthcare challenges, not only of today, but also for tomorrow. So this is the, the talk is, is titled Crisis as Catalyst. And um, you know, the COVID-19 crisis is changing every business model. Um, you name it, it's, it's going to be impacted by it. So it's, it's very much like the, uh, the asteroid that uh, wiped out the dinosaurs. It's going to have the same sort of a disruptive effect on business models everywhere, including in healthcare. And, and UC Riverside with a strong base in technology and healthcare, uh, this is a very relevant, um, relevant topic for, for folks at the university. So, um, as Misty mentioned, I spent a really long time as an entrepreneur before I became a VC. And the perpetual question vexing you as an entrepreneur is, what does the future look like? And it's really easy to get this wrong, um, which is what results in companies that go out of business. Um, it's, it's really key, of course, to get the answer right. So how does this apply today? So if you look at um, what our long-term healthcare needs 
or an R as defined by the World Health Organization, it's we don't have enough healthcare, so we need to be able to provision high volume healthcare, which is contactless um, as much as possible to, so that it can be scalable. This is our long-term need within the field of healthcare. And if you look at what uh, the COVID-19 situation provides in the way of a mirror is we need exactly the same thing. We need high volume healthcare, which can be delivered scalably in a contactless way. So what you see here, what the COVID-19 crisis is doing, is actually showing us the path forward for healthcare provisioning period. So essentially the future is now. So as a, an entrepreneur, you may be scratching your head wondering, what does the future look like? The answer may well be the future will look like today. If we can solve the problems for COVID-19 today, we end up solving the problems that we will be facing in healthcare going forward. Um, I have two basic guideposts when I think about innovation in general and here for healthcare-based innovation specifically. And that one is that healthcare is a human right, but it doesn't matter where you live on this planet, we don't have enough of it. And it's never been the case in human history that we've had enough, uh, enough health care. That's one basic guidepost. The other is that healthcare is a zero sum game. A dollar you spend on X is a dollar you cannot be spent on Y. And this is why uh, we really need to focus on impact. Um, certainly if I had, uh, I don't know, plastic surgery to take away my wrinkles, um, that's not really high impact. Uh, that, that dollar is better spent on curing a disease or making somebody get better, not in helping me alleviate my wrinkles. But so you know, healthcare is a zero sum game in general. And for us to have the most efficient use of our healthcare dollars, we really need to focus on maximizing the impact of each dollar. So, so these are the two basic guideposts. There may be a third, I don't know, but I thought hard about it, but I think that these two really do define, um, define the dynamics of healthcare. Um, so impact-driven innovation, what does it mean? Um, so being a computer scientist by training, I, I tend to reduce things down to the mathematics, but uh, what might an innovation equation look like? Well, if you have a numerator and denominator where your numerator is impact and B is complexity, um, finding impact in healthcare innovation means finding problems with have large values of A, not large values of B. If you wanna maximize impact, um, you want the numerator to be as large as possible and the denominator to be as small as possible. That's what helps yield impact. And digital healthcare solutions, if you think about it, have the biggest impact uh, uh, going forward because of the ubiquity of the mobile device and the deluge of data that we're being subjected to today. Um, the last time I saw, I think there were somewhere in excess of 6 billion mobile phones on the planet, somewhere around 3 billion smartphones. So it's a very, very ubiquitous device. Uh, you may not have access to healthcare anywhere in your community, but you will have access to your, your smartphone. So it's a wonderful platform through which to deliver healthcare. Um, and what the COVID-19 crisis has done is it's really focused on that impact equation, that A over B. Um, how do we uh, innovate uh, and provide scalable solutions, non-pharmaceutical solutions, because we don't have a vaccine as yet? How do we provide those non-pharmaceutical interventions with maximum impact? And this again goes back to the healthcare as a zero sum equation. So this is what COVID-19 has focused on us on. Scalability, non-pharmaceutical interventions, maximum impact, healthcare as a zero sum game. And those are the same uh, factors, the same dynamics, which will be true 10 years from now, 20 years from now, even once the COVID-19 crisis has been solved. So this is why um, I'm just going to uh, drop once again into very simple math proof on, uh, on why uh, today's crisis is such an effective catalyst for healthcare innovation. So if you think about um, if X uh, identifies the COVID-19 present and Y is the post-COVID-19 future, and once again, we're trying to solve that innovation equation, uh, impact, right, A over B. Uh, so you know, what we're trying to find today in the COVID-19 world is uh, innovation f of x equals the a over b. This is we're going to find impact solutions there. And for the future, the same is true. We're going to be trying to find impactful solutions, large values of a, smaller values of b, which help us address our future healthcare needs. So essentially, f of x is equal to f of y, or the present defines the future. 
So truly, I believe that the crisis today does give us an opportunity in crafting solutions which can uh, solve not only today's problems, but also lay the groundwork for solving tomorrow's problems. And this, in this way, it uh, solves that entrepreneur's challenge of, you know, what does the future look like? The COVID-19 crisis may have brought that future to us today. And if we can solve the healthcare scalability equation in the age of COVID-19, uh, perhaps we also solve the healthcare as a human right problem, challenge for our future. And digital health, uh, and this is partially informed by the fact that, I'm, again, I'm a computer scientist by training, so I have, a, I have a bias here, but that said, I think digital health does have the biggest potential for impact because it's so scalable, uh, because it is so ubiquitous. Because it's ubiquitous, digital health allows us to meet patients where they are, wherever they might be, um, and the, the data centricity of it allows us to provide very targeted bridges to care. Uh, both today in the COVID-19 current, as well as in our post-COVID-19 future. So digital health is a, is a pretty broad spectrum. Um, the article that's screenshotted here on the left was an interview with the CEO of Novartis. Um, and in this interview, basically, he said that doing drug discovery using AI and big data is a very, very difficult problem. So uh, this is what Novartis was grappling with. Uh, it's a very worthy problem to solve, but it's a difficult problem to solve. A uh, screenshot on the right there is just one of the many, and it seems to be an infinite number of these out there. It's one of the many um, uh, fitness activity trackers that are out there that you can download to your mobile phone. Uh, both of these solutions have their challenges. Um, the one on the left uh, has a challenge in that the, the, the de denominator value of B seems to be very large. It's a very difficult problem to do drug discovery using AI and, uh, and big data. It's not an intractable problem, but it's a very difficult one. And the, the problem with the uh, solution there on the right is that it may be trivially simple. So B is, is asymptotically approaching zero, whereas on the, the um, innovation on the left-hand side, B may be asymptotically approaching a number that's really, really large. Uh, if you're a startup, you will never have enough money to start, solve those large B problems. Those sorts of problems are best left to the large pharmaceutical players, people like Novartis. So your target really needs to be on finding problems which have a large value of A, but with a tractable, a solvable value of B. So essentially, if you look at the spectrum of digital healthcare innovation with step counters at one end, drug discovery on the other end, you're shooting for the golden middle, this virtualization of healthcare, which are problems which have large values of B, but very tractable, excuse me, large values of A, but very tractable values of B. And it turns out there are many such solutions that are out there. Um, great example here, this was uh, published in the Lancet back in January. Many of you may be familiar with it. Uh, it's a wonderful example of a large value of A and a tractable value of B. And this had to do with uh, capturing Fitbit data. Uh, Fitbit are, of course, very ubiquitous, very, uh, very cheap. In fact, I have, happen to have one on my wrist right now as we speak. And what they were able to do with this was um, predict the onset of, of the flu, uh, looking at things that were quite simple, resting heart rate and activity level. And this was done pre-COVID, but uh, certainly with the annual cycle of the flu, it's a very informative thing, both on an individual basis and on a population basis, to know about the onset of a flu epidemic in any, in, in any region. Uh, probably doubly the case now under COVID-19 and, and continues to be uh, a relevant uh, problem for, for mankind. And if you look at the excerpted text down at the bottom, um, you can see the correlations of the final models were ranged from 0.84 to 0.97. So a very high degree of fidelity uh, yielded by a simple you know, activity tracker here, as you see in my wrist. Um, interestingly, of course, uh, Google was the company that bought, um, bought Fitbit for $2.5 billion um, about nine months ago. But here's a, a solution for a vexing and large problem in human healthcare, which had a fairly straightforward solution. And Fitbit, it turns out, has multiple applications. So when you think about COVID-19, the COVID-19 current, um, hypoxia is actually an issue for COVID-19 patients. Um, blood oxygen monitoring is built into your Fitbit. So here's yet another signal for something like the, the current COVID-19 uh, crisis. And going forward, thinking about even post-vaccine uh, post for COVID-19, 
um, you know, that hypoxia uh, and blood oxygen level uh, um, even relates to things such as sleep apnea, which will be ongoing conditions here among the human population. So here you see multiple sorts of problems that are being solved by very straightforward um, use of AI and data. So large value of A and a very tractable value of B. We'll go through a, a few other examples here of how the current COVID-19 present might mirror the post-COVID-19 future. So one of the issues that has been cropping up with COVID-19 has been the mental health consequences. So this has been pretty richly documented in the academic literature as well as in the, in, in the public press, a couple of screenshots here. But um, if you look at what the UN and the World Health Organization had, had already defined, um, the leading cause of disability worldwide is, of course, uh, mental health issues. So how can you solve problems for the COVID-19 present when people are facing a lot of mental strain as well as address a problem that will persist even after the COVID-19 vaccine, uh, which is mental health issues that people, people might be suffering from. And once again, this is uh, the largest cause of disabil disability worldwide. So it turns out if you're looking at digital health and doing diagnosis of mental health at scale, there are many, many ways of doing this. And just a few examples here of using digital signals to diagnose mental health issues. And this is once again a way of delivering um, you know, highly scalable healthcare that's completely contactless using devices which are already ubiquitous among the human population. And this can be used not only for doing diagnosis, but it turns out that digital health solutions have been used even to do treatment. A um, couple of papers here, the one on the bottom uh, came from Stanford and uh, Stanford actually went so far as to, and again, high volume healthcare here being delivered in a contactless fashion. Um, Stanford went so far as to actually release this online as an online chatbot. So it might be that you're, you're you know, having some, some mental health issues that you may be concerned with. Um, you may not have access to a psychiatrist because of geography or income, um, but certainly you deserve the level of um, mental health care that you can get. Here's a way of doing so via chatbot, which uh, mimics talk therapy. Um, and then, you know, this can be taken even further. You can see about marrying something like Wobot um, online with some, some cutting edge computer science technology to generate uh, human-like images to actually walk you through that talk therapy. And this would be a wonderful way of being able to bring scalable mental health care. And there's been quite a bit of work that's been done on scalable mental health care using digital platforms. So this allows you to bring scale and also equity to populations who may not have had access to this sort of care in the past. So once again, here's the way of delivering high volume health care that's contactless. It's a need today because of the strains of COVID-19. It's a need tomorrow once COVID-19 has been vanquished. So if we can solve the problem for today, we also end up solving the problem for tomorrow. Um, Digital mental health care, turns out that uh, there's started to be here, even within the US AMA and, and uh, public bodies who've started to modify the policies, the, the standards of care that we're able to dispense to deal with, uh, to deal with these issues. Uh, this is happening in the US currently because of the COVID-19 crisis and because of just economic strains and, and uh, things like that in developing areas, it turns out this sort of effort was already underway. So you know, we're able to deliver some solutions here in the, in the US and developed economies. And these sorts of solutions also have a deep applicability in developing economies and in healthcare systems that are less resourced than, than are here. So uh, here's another example of a large A and a tractable B. We're all very familiar with curve flattening. Uh, this was first brought to before um, uh, out of some work that was done in the UK earlier this year. Um, this is what's going on in the COVID-19 world. Um, how does this apply in the post-COVID-19 world? Well, how about the um, cardiovascular disease, which is the leading cause of mortality in India? Um, how can one achieve curve flattening for something like cardiovascular disease, which again, a very large problem in the developing world. And it turns out even in the, developing, in the developed world, cardiovascular disease affects nearly half of American adults. So what if, if you think about this large affliction, cardiovascular disease, which is 
the largest killer in India and uh, afflicts half of the U.S. population. Uh, what if here in the, in the U.S. you could prevent almost a million cardiovascular events a year, um, gain two and a half million quality adjusted life years, save $42 billion in healthcare costs? Wouldn't it be wonderful if you could do these things? And how could you do these things? So all those figures cited in the previous slide were, uh, were in the, the research that was shown here, which is essentially using behavioral economics to achieve those outcomes for cardiovascular disease. And um, behavioral economics have been used in the field of cardiovascular disease in a number of different studies. And behavioral economics, as we probably all know, is exactly the same technique that uh, Amazon uses to get you to push the buy button. Imagine being able to use behavioral science instead to drive positive health impact. Instead of getting using behavioral economics to get us to push buy or keep watching or like using that same technology to drive cardiovascular health and to achieve all the results that were talked about on the previous slide, not only here in the US, but also in the developing world. Once again, here's uh, highly scalable healthcare that can be delivered in a contactless way. So, and this too, it mirrors what, what we're doing today in the COVID-19 world, where we're trying to find non-pharmaceutical interventions, many of them behavioral economics based, to achieve a positive healthcare outcome and how those same sorts of techniques can be applied going forward. Um, a final example here, which is um, the, the shortage of hospital beds that first sprung up in Italy when the COVID-19 crisis became manifest there and that we're now experiencing here in the US. And so you can see the headline here, this is from Stat News, um, treat more patients at home. This is how you free up hospital bed supply. And certainly this is a crisis in the COVID-19 world, but even before that happened, it turned out that the U.S. was facing a deficit of inpatient beds. As the U.S. population was aging, demand for, for inpatient beds was increasing as well. So here's a way that the current COVID-19 present was mirroring something which is going to be part of the post-COVID-19 future in the U.S. So here too, there, there is a solution, and this is hospital at home. You know, the virtualization of care by taking patients who may be well-served by going home and being monitored there by a digital means and also via some physician visits. And this has been in the academic um, research for quite some time, and it's been very effective because it delivers high-quality results at lower cost. Uh, Johns Hopkins pioneered a good deal of this work, but once again, here's a way of taking um, a need that has, has become very acute in the COVID-19 present when we, where we, when we lack inpatient hospital beds, craft a solution for that, and have that also meet a need that was going to become manifest anyway in our future. And once again, this, this is a means of delivering high volume healthcare, lower cost, in a completely contactless way. And COVID-19, of course, uh, today uh, you, you test for it in a lab, um, but because of the, the strains that is put on the testing system and the healthcare system, um, there's been now been these developments of, of having devices that you can plug into your mobile phone and have that serve as a diagnosis platform. So another wonderful way to do high volume healthcare in a contactless way. This technology, uh, which has now been developed at the University of Utah, was originally developed to diagnose things like glassy fever, hemorrhagic fever, Zika virus. It was originally developed for that, but those did not cause that same sort of a, acute um, demand on the healthcare system. So it had been developing much more slowly. Now with the catalyzing effect of COVID-19, uh, a new use has been found for that technology. Um, and again, very mobile way of doing this on your smartphone. And the smartphone is a wonderful platform for delivering innovation. Um, once again, we don't need to focus on large values of B and try and do drug discovery to achieve impact. We can achieve impact in many other ways with smaller values of B. So you can see the headline here, turning your, your uh, smartphone into an ultrasound scanner in, in Africa, uh, detecting middle ear fluid, detecting oral cancer all done by the smartphone as the device. 
the um, the oral cancer is uh, is work that was done with uh, I think convolutional neural networks of detecting and doing image analysis for for throat images using smartphones. So a nice combination of computer science with medical science. Um, the FDA is approving these sorts of mobile, highly scalable sorts of solutions. Here's how you can do uh, you know, urine testing uh, using mobile devices. Um, cardiogram here can, can use mobile devices to detect signs of diabetes. And as many of you may have seen, the FDA just approved the first prescription video game for kids with ADHD. So very scalable. You don't need to have access to a pharmacy. You just need to have a smartphone. So for parents who may think that, well, I can't afford the drug, uh, I can't get to the, the pharmacy, whatever, there's a way of providing very highly scalable healthcare. So um, a lot of, of uh, opportunities have opened up to us if we can see um, the the catalyzing effects that, that COVID-19 can have in the field of healthcare. And this applies in other industries as well. Um, but the healthcare one is probably most acutely affected right now. But there are a lot of supporting, uh, disrupting technologies that are out there today. Uh, so there's increased virtualization that's happening as a consequence of COVID-19. Uh, the impact of 5G and is 5G more impactful as a multiplayer gaming platform or for the provisioning of telehealth? I think we know the answer to that. Um, data is becoming ever more hyperdimensional, so we can do much more diagnosis. Think you can think of the examples like of the of Fitbit and the signals that it's collecting. But data is becoming ever more hyperdimensional, which means that we can do much more um, predictive healthcare as a consequence. Um, behavioral economics is a wonderful tool. Heretofore, it's been used for driving commerce. There's a very rich set of research that's been done of using behavioral economics for achieving positive impact in the field of healthcare. And of course, ethics uh, uh, prevails over all. Um, anything that uh, ingests data has a, a large risk of creating a privacy violation. So data ethics always need to be considered in whatever solution one might craft. So entrepreneurial advice, um, with all of these uh, uh, trends that are going on in, in the market and in technology, how does this apply when you're out there trying to to uh, secure financing for your startup. Um, first of all, the, uh, your communication with investors is going to be uh, quite changed probably for the coming year. It's all going to be online. So with that in mind, uh, you actually have to present differently than you may ever have done before. Um, there have been a number of stories on this which are, are pretty informative and insightful. Um, I like this one. It's actually entertaining and well-written, but it's in the Washington Post and some really practical tips on how you should engage with uh, counterparties over uh, video platforms such as Zoom. Um, Zoom changes uh, interaction dynamics. So, uh, you know, the focus is on your talking head. People will no longer be, uh, uh, you know, focused on your, your Rolex watch or whatever. Um, the body language cues that you can convey are actually quite limited, so you have to bear this in mind. So smile, it, it turns out that uh, smiling is the best way of communicating to somebody that you like them, right? Because it shows that you're happy. So who better to invest in than somebody who likes you, right? So smile, it's a very simple thing to smile. Uh, smiling tells people you like them and people wanna invest in, in companies where the counterparty actually likes them. And uh, it's also been found that even slight delays in response, uh, which could be due to something completely innocent like network latency, unfortunately it has the effect of convincing the person at the other end of the line that maybe you're not as smart as, as uh, you, you need to be. So something to think about is that the dynamics of human com communication, which for you know, millions of years you've been accustomed to in-person, face-to-face communication, um, all of that has gone out the window. And there may be other things that we've not considered in the past, which we need to be factoring into our video pitches. So smile and think about having a measured pace of communication so that questions and answers, uh, that little latency that might be introduced to it, into it, uh, may not have a, a negative uh, interpretation on this part of the listener. Um, Zoom changes human interaction dynamics. There's a complete focus on your slides. 
So, you know, were I giving this pitch in person, maybe you'd be looking at me, looking at the slides, looking at me, smiling, whatever. But in Zoom, you're probably looking only at the slides. So your slides really do need to be perfect. Um, you know, and you have to think about the messaging. What are the messages in each slide, the visual impact of each slide? Think it through because this is the principal means of communicating the value of your startup to the investor. Uh, intersperse your, your talk with time to collect investor feedback. If we were meeting in person, um, then you're able to collect uh, visual cues. Is this person uh, showing interest? They're showing confusion. Uh, what might their, their emotions be? Should I ask, a, ask them to give a clarifying uh, question? Things like that. We're, we're accustomed to picking up on video cues, uh, you know, visual cues rather, when we're meeting in person. Um, in a Zoom-based world, think about audio cues, which means maybe even stick in a little bit of spacing into your talks, which gives you a chance to ask the, the investor uh, you know, what their thoughts are on a particular topic or business model or things like that. Just so you can make it a, a very conversational interaction and collect another level of, of input and feedback through the audio cues. So new body language, right? So this is changing everything, bear that in mind. Uh, there are a lot of positive aspects to uh, Zoom-based uh, um, funding pitches nowadays. It used to be that, um, you know, if, if you wanted financing, you would need to go meet with that investor in person, and that investor would like that you be somewhere nearby because it's easiest to meet up with you, to communicate with you if he or she can drive and meet you for coffee or meet you at your office, whatever. But once everybody has been pushed into the world of Zoom because of the, uh, the COVID-19 crisis, uh, maybe location starts to matter less because maybe the investor thinks it doesn't matter if this company is a block away or 10,000 miles away, the quality of the interaction is exactly the same. So in this way, perhaps this democratizes the access to capital. So in this way, perhaps this is a really a good move because it, uh, it frees smart, passionate entrepreneurs from the captivity of geography. Today's financing realities. Okay, we're in the middle of a, a, a financial meltdown kind of worldwide. Um, and this is uh, really manifesting in, in startups today because um, if, uh, if cash is in short supply, if the future is uncertain, investors will steward that cash for their existing investments so that they can ensure their survival versus putting money into a new startup. So this is a, a real challenge. It's a real challenge that's going on nowadays. Uh, hence the circling vulture over here. Um, so who's gonna survive in this climate? So if you're all familiar with the whole concept of unicorns coming like WeWork, et cetera. 2019 was really the year of the unicorn. They were very much in the, uh, the public press. Uh, for 2020 and probably 2021, 20, uh, we're gonna be in the year of the camel. So rather than having, you know, flash and, and, uh, and magic about you. You really have to be um, a company and organization that's, that's, that's resilient, that's efficient, and is there for the long haul. So you know, when you engage with uh, investors, um, talk about your cash efficiency. This is going to be very important for an investor. It's gonna be important for you. Uh, talk about your disruptive business model, because even though we may be in a financial crisis right now, Disruptive business models still do exactly that. They disrupt, which means the existing players are going to go down. So you must be cash efficient and you must have a disruptive business model. And there is no bad time ever to have a disruptive business model, by the way. Um, markets, uh, all investors for all time have always cared about this, but big future facing markets. Markets need to be big. They need to be multi-billion dollars. Make sure you can communicate that. Um, the path to exit today is about eight years. So um, you got to start a finance today. Your exit will likely be in 2028. So you must be doing future facing markets. And uh, probably most importantly of all, you need to show that you have a tenacious team, particularly in the midst of the financial and social crisis that we're facing today, tenacious teams will win. So which investors, um, if you are out there looking for money, who are your best uh, um, venture funds to go to? Uh, venture funds with recent raises. So if they closed a fund, say in the past year, um, they haven't committed that much to an existing portfolio, so they have funds to invest. And they'll be thinking, you know, in the current market, valuations are down. What a great time to invest. 
So find folks who have done recent raises, uh, fresh funds, that, because again, they have, future, uh, they have fewer commitments to existing investments. And corporate VC is always a great path as well, because corporates are trying to stave off the process of, um, of uh, um, obsolescence through, through you know, not evolving quickly enough. So they're driven by innovation. Corporate ventures are driven by innovation more so than they are from just uh, bringing a return from the investment itself because they are worried about disruption constantly. So corporate VC may be a really good avenue today for a startup. So just remember that this is just the reality. Valuations will be down. There's no escaping that. That's the current reality. Uh, cash is going to be short and the time to exit will be long. Um, and terms were going to be aggressive. That's also the reality when, uh, when it's a buyer's market, which is, which it is today, um, the buyers will be setting the terms. So the investors will be setting the terms. So be ready for that. Um, the IPO market will likely be unpredictable for the, for the next little while. So with that in mind, um, bear in mind that even before the COVID-19 crisis hit us, over 90% of exits were by acquisition. So doubly the case now, assume that your exit will be by an acquisition. Uh, partner early with potential acquirers. So think about you know, you're getting your company going, think about who might acquire you in the next three years, the next five years, the next eight years, and partner with them. Get into a distribution partnership with them, a co-selling agreement, an OEM agreement. Build those partnerships early so that they're already wired in as your potential acquirers. And likely your exit is going to be via a stock transaction, not a cash transaction, because cash may be short, stock is generally not. So innovation in times of crisis, is it a good, good thing to innovate and uh, start an entrepreneur, entrepreneurial effort in the middle of a crisis such as this? Um, actually, it turns out that the academic research, and there's a bit of it, here's one that's cited here, is that it's actually a, a pretty good time to, to start a company because um, you're focused on things which are real needs. You're not defocused by an overabundance of cash that might exist in a, in a frothy market. So it forces you to be uh, more clear-eyed in, in putting your company together. And again, that's what there's a couple of quotes here from this particular article. Um, multidisciplinarity is key nowadays, which means you want to have a broad team with individuals from a diverse set of backgrounds. Uh, that is the winning formula of the future. And in every time of crisis, good teams survive and thrive. So be very, very disciplined in who your, your coworkers, co-founders are. By the way, what do investors look at? That's what they look at because they know that times are tough, crisis abounds. Um, who, who is it that's able to learn, adapt, survive? Good teams, tenacious teams. So a um, couple of things to look at here. Uh, you can just see the headlines. Um, Harvard, the well-off, outnumbered low income 23 to one. Article on the bottom from the New York Times, some colleges have more students in the top 1% than the bottom 60%. Um, that's a, a bit of the, the reality today. Um, interesting article here that you should read, which is uh, when you get a chance, written by Rod Shetty, who's at Stanford and others. Um, and, and the excerpted text at the top uh, says it all. You can read that at, uh, when you get a chance. But basically, um, you know, there is uh, uh, smart people are distributed evenly across the population, regardless of demographic. And where does di where does this uh, impact Riverside, and where does Riverside come in? Uh, it turns out, if you, again, if you look at the academic um, research, diversity is what drives innovation. And if you look at the UCR community specifically, Riverside. Uh, county more broadly, it's very diverse. It actually looks like the rest of the world. Who better to solve the world's problems than a student population, a faculty population, a community population that actually looks like the rest of the world? So this is a tremendous strength for UCR and Riverside County is the diversity of the population. And that's really, truly, there's no end of this stuff uh, that, that talks about diversity's role in, in clear thinking, creativity, and innovation. There's just a few examples here, uh, should any of you want to read them, but it's uh, pretty much an irrefutable fact that diversity really drives strong innovation. And 
what what is the broader impact of innovation and in particular technology um, technological innovation? Uh, Enrico Moretti is an economics professor at Berkeley. Um, he's done this great work on local multipliers. And what a local multiplier is, is the multiplying effect of additional jobs created by um, the creation of a, a job in a particular sector. So um, you can see some of the ex excerpted text here on the bottom, but a, a manufacturing job will create 1.6 additional jobs, et cetera. And if you read through the paper, what you'll find is that technology innovation drives the highest multiple. Uh, it's 4.9. So uh, for every technology job you create, you create about five jobs in the broader community. So why is technology innovation and entrepreneurship important in Riverside County? It's actually the best vehicle for driving jobs in the broader Riverside economy. So the time for innovation is now, you know, f of x is f of y. If you look at the, the graph here on the left, uh, that that span between healthcare resources and healthcare demands in the age of COVID-19, the opportunity for innovation is uh, what's shown there by the, the, the double-ended blue arrow. It's that space that needs to be filled. And as it turns out, that's exactly the space that needs to be filled even after COVID-19. So this is a, a, a wonderful time to solve today's problems and by doing so, solve our problems for tomorrow as well. So thank you, UC Riverside. That was my last slide. I wanted to leave some time here for questions. I'm going to close with a quote from uh, William Watkinson, which is, it's better to light a candle than to curse the darkness. So with that, I will stop and happy to take any questions. Well, you, you got a thank you right off the bat, Shomit, and I'm not surprised. There's probably going to be 50 more of those coming. So while we're waiting for, for questions, um, my, my background, I thought hopefully I can just lead off with one. My, my background is behavioral economics as well. So naturally I glommed right over that comment. And one of the big bugaboos that I've always seen, and I was intrigued by your discussion on digital healthcare solutions, virtual health, is that um, um, while clinicians ca uh, can be vigilant relative to a disease or a disorder, we patients or healthcare consumers are not the best citizens in the world relative to short-term compliance, long-term adherence. And so whenever you mention behavioral economics, behavioral motivation and so forth, are you finding any solutions or ventures that are being introduced to the economy that are focusing more on how we as healthcare consumers and patients can behave better, be better citizens in healthcare? In a virtual yeah. world. Yeah, great question. Yeah, I think not enough of it. I think this is where the opportunity lies, is that the academic research have shown that, you know, proven that this is the case, that you can improve healthcare outcomes by very simple and cost-effective mechanisms, behavioral economics, but it has largely lain in the realm of, of academics only. It actually has not been, been productized. And this is why I think there's such a large opportunity there. Because healthcare, it is a zero-sum game. So if we can save some money through a very simple, low-cost behavioral economics technique, that leaves that money left over to use on something that's more profound and uh, you know, cash-intensive but can actually save someone's life then and there. So um, I think there's great opportunity here. And um, it often goes neglected. I think people get focused on the big science solutions. And we don't need the you know, big science solutions. Yes, we need them in the long term and we need them in the short term, but we shouldn't only focus on the big science solutions at the expense of the small science solutions, which yields such sure. powerful results. Sure. Thanks so much. Thomas Sai, uh, great to see you. I'm glad that you joined us today. Uh, it's been a long time, huh? A, a grand total of a whole day, but uh, you had a question. Feel free to jump in. I'm, I'm reading it here. Uh, your question is with regard to key criteria, key criteria, but please uh, jump right in. Yeah, thank you, Shumit, for the um, great presentation. So um, you highlighted that, you know, this is a time of crisis and uh, crises present different opportunities. So I'm wondering, um, with that as a context, uh, what do you think are some of the key differences in terms of funding criteria? Is it still the same or is, has it uh, changed? And then secondly, because this is very much a SBIR, 
TTR talk, are there differences between, you know, looking at funding for that versus say the traditional VC route? Yeah, uh, really good question. Uh, uh, so what investors look for is the presence of a big market. And in the past, um, we believe the, the vision of the, um, the entrepreneur. The entrepreneur comes in and says, I see this big market and I'm going to do it. And most of the time, the entrepreneur is wrong. If you look at the statistics, you know, 70 plus percent of startups fail uh, through lack of execution and also from lack of the correct vision. Um, what, so investors are always driven by that large market. What, what might be different today is that uh, an entrepreneur is able to say, there's going to be a large market in eight years and solving that um, involves solving the problem that exists today. So if you think about the hospital at home example, you could, have, you could go in and say, look, there's going to be a shortage of, of uh, inpatient beds because of the aging US population. Uh, by the way, there's a shortage of inpatient beds today. So if we can deliver a hospital at home solution today that's digitally based, um, that solves today's problem or helps address today's problem, it also helps tomorrow's problem. So uh, there is less speculation involved. So I think in that regard, that dynamic has changed, but the dynamic of investors caring about large markets, that hasn't changed. That I think will always continue to be the case. Um, and with regard to uh, VC versus SBIR, um, I don't know enough, of, I'll, I'll uh, defer to, to Misty and Martin here on the SBIR side, but um, uh, uh, venture investors are, or get paid on on uh, driving big results, and if you don't get the big results, you're out of a job. It's it's, it's uh, uh, very unforgiving. So this is why we try and find as many large market opportunities as possible, because we know that you know two thirds of those large market opportunities will not work out. So that one third that remain need to give us the returns for the two thirds that also failed. So anyway, that's that's the essential driving force uh, in VC investment. And I'll, I'll let Martin and Misty talk about SBIR. Thank you. Great. Uh, thanks, Thomas. Um, uh, Ed Weinberg, feel free to jump in. Or if you want, uh, I can. I can see. Yeah, I can. I can see the uh, the chat screen. I, I have it up here. Yeah. Yeah, uh, my, my, okay. yeah, so you can see that it's a tougher road to, uh, to commercialization. Um, I think that digital healthcare solutions, um, they have a steep slope, but they may not be as steep as some of the, of the, the issues. If, uh, if you look at the, the interview with the Novartis CEO, uh, I think the problems that they're confronting on drug discovery are, are, are pretty mind bending and they will be solved but it's, uh, it's gonna require a large application of investment dollars into that. And that may be a you know, tractable problem for them to address because they're a large pharmaceutical, but you know, the startup, which is Marty, Martin, Misty, and Shomet, are never gonna be able to raise that amount of money. But yet we can still make a large impact on healthcare uh, with a solution that will be more approachable because it's smartphone based. So for, for startup efforts, which are less capitalized than and R&D efforts at large pharmaceutical firms, this is the best path. And uh, the follow-on question beneath that was that uh, VC aggressiveness in terms of increased demand for equity. Um, I haven't seen that yet. Um, I think that it will happen because uh, again, this is a, it's going to become at early stage investment. I think it will increasingly become a buyer's market It'll be more deals looking for money and fewer VCs willing to spend that money. So I think that terms will become more aggressive. Um, as yet, I haven't seen it, but it might be that because we're still too close to the onset of this crisis to know how it will manifest going forward. But um, yeah, the best way to, to combat um, super aggressive terms is to have more than one player come to the table. The best way to have more than one player come to the table is to have a really compelling story where everyone wants to play in your deal. Uh, hey, show me the Scott Borowski. How are you? Hey, I'm doing well, Scott. I, I was just going to add to that. Um, I think you're right. I think in the Bay Area, um, there, there really hasn't been much of a, a, a valuation haircut yet. But I can just tell you, we're we're helping five or six startups here in Southern California raise capital now. And in Southern California, the investors have started to uh, 
ask for uh, lower valuations and, and our, our, our the aggressiveness has increased in the last four months. So it may, may not have hit Bay Area, but I just wanted to let you know it is definitely hit, it hit Southern California. Yeah, yeah. And I think it, that may be inevitable. It may, uh, may spill up here a little bit more slowly, but um, you know, economics is, is economics. It's all based on supply and demand. Uh, so David was asking a question on what's the role of government in digital health and are some countries outpacing others? Yeah, excellent questions. Um, I think uh, government and digital health, uh, the U.S., the prior um, FDA commissioner, Scott Gottlieb, had already set in motion uh, making it easier to get approve, FDA approval for digital health solutions. So that was a, a great thing that, uh, that uh, Dr. Gottlieb did. And I think one of the things that government also needs to do is to ensure the ethical use of the data, to have those regulations in place. Because once any of us as consumers find out that medical information is being compromised, either through intention or through accident, guess what? We're not using that solution anymore. So um, I think you know, government needs to come in and put in some strong regulation there because it's very easy um, to have very intimate information you know, leak out. Um, so uh, so I, again, I think that the FDA has set some, some wheels in motion already and uh, um, some additional measures need to be taken on patient privacy, data privacy. And from, from what I've seen, I, uh, the second part of David's question was, are some countries outpacing others? Um, there's a good deal of effort that's going on here in the US. Um, look no further than Verily up in uh, South City. Uh, look no further than Google buying Fitbit. Um, and uh, certainly China is also uh, very aggressively pursuing this. Rosabelle, you had a question? Um, Shami, thank you very much for uh, your participation and for uh, sharing with uh, us uh, your, uh, your uh, of perception and your thoughts in terms of how this crisis can be also an opportunity for innovators to actually come up with solutions. One of the, I have a question regard, actually two questions. The first one, is related to the flow of capital. You, you talked about the shortage of capital and that venture investors are essentially retreating, right? Because of the, of, the, of the crisis. But at the same time, there is a lot of need for innovation. There's a lot of unmet needs. So where is this capital and how we at the, in the Inland Empire can access it? Because there's a big need, there's a demand, but we need to connect, and how do we do that? Yeah, a great question. I think maybe the answer to that um, uh, is, is that word connect. Uh, I think there's uh, such great brain power in the Inland Empire. I think there's great appreciation of real world problems, and that's, that's somewhat unique you know, in the world, right? Uh, in that you have a strong base of academic research that's being done at UC Riverside, in a community which is diverse and looks like the rest of the world. So this is great. Um, what's lacking perhaps is the ability uh, or the past history of being able to connect with the people who can provide that financing. Uh, investors uh, are, are ruthless in the way that they just look at returns. In the end, they really don't care how, they, how or where they got that return from because we get hired or fired based on delivering returns. People in the end, our LPs, our investors, don't care where that company was was based. We're looking for good deals. So you know, I think that uh, UC Riverside and Riverside County are both well placed to to find those next good deals because of the diversity of the population uh, married with the you know the excellence of the university. Thanks, Shomi. Uh, Gloria Gonzalez had a question, and Gloria, feel free to to jump in, or I can I can read your question for you, whatever you prefer. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you very much, uh, Somi, for a very enlightening uh, talk. And my question is uh, regarding other sectors. I mean, your talk has focused very much on healthcare, but uh, this acceleration of the future, where do we look at uh, beyond healthcare? Yeah, uh, uh, great question. Yeah, and so uh, anticipating that, um, I've, <laughs> I've been in the middle of writing an article for uh, UC Berkeley on how this, uh, how COVID-19 also has a catalyzing effect on higher education. Uh, and also, if you think about higher education, it too is an education period, is a human right. 
but uh, it's been restricted by geography or economics. But now that we're all trapped at home, guess what? Education is virtualized. It must virtualize. And if it virtualizes, just as with healthcare, it's been broadening its reach. So how can we now re-envision and redesign education for the 21st century? Because otherwise, the current educational system is not largely different from Socrates, right? Uh, he just stood in a room and he said wise things to a group of students, and that's still your you know, standard college campus today. Um, and it needn't be so. And how can we anticipate meeting the needs of higher education going forward as catalyzed by COVID-19? Um, you know, everyone's been thrust into this crisis of, oh my gosh, if people are only studying online, then our tuition is going to drop to the floor. What does this mean? Um, and that is the downside of it. But the upside of it is that it forces us to re-envision higher education in a way that allows us to bring equity. So um, stay tuned. If, uh, if you connect with me on LinkedIn, uh, as soon as it gets published, I'll push it out there. But that's just my, my uh, ruminations on the positive impacts that this catalyzing effect can have on, on bringing equity to education. Thank you. Thank you. Piyush, great to see that you joined us today. We have to catch up before the end of the week for obvious reasons. But uh, feel free to jump in and, and ask your question. Sure. Um, thank you, uh, Shomit, for an excellent presentation. It was uh, very well informed and uh, very, very useful. Um, so my question is about data privacy. So um, if we have to develop uh, an application uh, for let's say hypoxia for COVID patients or things like that, um, that can be that can do it on the mobile devices. Uh, uh, how do we address data privacy? And is it really an issue, or or are there, or is it really not an issue? And if yeah. it is an issue, how do we address it? Yeah, uh, this is this is a, a probably it may be the um, the key issue in this because. We can deliver lots of great solutions, but if we decide that they're compromising our privacy, we're not going to use them, right? Uh, so um, as much as we think about the positive health impacts that we're building in, we have to also think about how do we continue to preserve the privacy of that data. Um, and it's basically a bottomless pit. And it's because we've got all this hyperdimensional data and hyperdimensional data feeds all sorts of hyperdimensional sorts of correlations and results. And that's where the danger lies. There's a very simple thing here. You think about, you know, I've got my photo, for example, it's up on our company website. Uh, it's on LinkedIn, it's Facebook, it's everywhere. You can see my picture, right? Well, you can do a you know, an AI facial analytic on my face and you can actually predict the state of my health. Also my sexual orientation, by the way, as uh, Stanford did a paper on the latter a couple of years ago. Uh, but people don't may not think about what are the downside effects of having my picture on the internet? Oh, there's no privacy that's, that's being divulged there. It's just what I look like. Well, no, actually it might tell us your sexual orientation and the state of your health. So what this means is that if you think about data privacy, even things like obfuscating my image slightly is an important way of maintaining data privacy. And it means that a hospital who may say, hey, send us your picture. This is a great way of doing identification and stratification of patient populations but they have to treat that photo as, as very, very private data because in the end, it's no different than your blood test results, for example. So um, I think this will be a continuing issue. Um, it's a very complex issue. It probably, you know, merit, it's got a lot of research done behind it, probably merits some long seminars uh, in discussing this sort of a thing. Um, but uh, in the end, um, every healthcare oriented um, solution Every educationally oriented solution, as we just talked about here with, uh, with Gloria, uh, will require that data privacy. If we don't, we'll end up in, with the Facebookization of healthcare or the Facebookization of education. Neither of those are good outcomes. One final Thank question, you. I think, from, from Joe and Misty. I think uh, our pump, our uh, carriage is just about to turn into a pumpkin. We're at that witching hour there. Uh, maybe Joe and um, yeah, one final question from Joe, and then and maybe we can hand it back to you, Misty. You still with us, Joe? Oh, 
Where the heck are you? Well, anyway, um, he was asking about uh, with an aging population, Shomit, patient privacy, security, and authentication needs in online telemed market for companies who provide these online digital remote authentication services. Can anyone of the panel quantify in numbers and dollars the size of this market? Does yeah, so kind of yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I got okay. the question, and okay. and the fact I'm going to guess that no one on the panel can, uh, or here can quantify, it, and that's a good thing. That means yeah. there's opportunity here. If we could say, oh yeah, yeah, there's a McKinsey report that quantified it. If McKinsey's already written about it, people are solving the problem already. So I think the fact that none of us have this number ready at hand means that it needs to be, uh, you know, calculated de novo. So this this tells you that there is a market opportunity here. It is a nascent market. But it, uh, I think it necessarily is a large market. Great. Uh, th thanks, Joe, and thanks, Joe. So, Misty, back to you. Maybe for mostly humanitarian reasons, we should let uh, Shomit get on with his life. But um, back over to you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining today. As um, a few of you asked in the chat, we will have the slides available. Um, Shomit's going to make those available to us, and we've recorded this webinar. It'll be up on our website. So I will share the slides with the registration list and you can look for the recording in the next week or so to be up on sbar.ucr.edu. And um, our next webinar is set for July 15th at 1230. So please join us and thank you again, everyone, for joining us today. And thank you, especially to Shomit. That was a wonderful presentation and we're glad that you could make it to our SBR talk series. I was honored. Thank you for having me. So much. We were honored, likewise. Okay. We're out of here. All right. Thank you very much Bye -bye. indeed. Bye. Thanks, Shamit.